Sigma Tiger News all up in your grill with the hottest, juiciest beef online. What do we got today? Body scans, Palestine plight, and protest to prison. <laughs> You're here with the big Sig Tig. What do we got popping today? Boom. Daniel Eck, next act. Full body scans for the people. The Spotify chief has co founded a new startup, Nico Health, that aims to make head to toe health scans part of the annual health checkup routine. And wouldn't that be great? Even if you could uh, have it, you'd probably be waiting months and months to get in uh, for these scans. Right now, currently over in Sweden, I believe, is the only place you can get them. Europe, uh, London might have an office. Let's see what's going on. Longevity has become kind of an obsession with tech moguls. Sam Altman, Peter Thiel, and Mr. Eck are among those who believe bright ideas. The right tech and bundles of capital can help humans live longer. Mr. Eck, 41, has invested millions personally, and through his investment firm Prima Materia in such startups around Europe, Neko Health is the only one for which he's taken the title of founder. And here is the full body scan. I guess you would stand up in the nude, the buff, and it would just go ahead and read your entire body. Let's see. The company says its full body scans can detect the onset of a host of cardiovascular and metabolic diseases, as well as skin condition. It calls its scans, which cost about 230 or 2,500 Swedish krona, a health check for your future self. Whole body scans have been around for a while, but they have taken off in recent years thanks to artificial intelligence and social media. Kim Kardashian helped put one buzzy rival, Pranuvo, on the map last summer when she referred to its MRI scanner as a life-saving machine in an Instagram post. Another, the New York-based Ezra, announced in February that it has raised $21 million to help it expand to 20 North American cities by year-end. So keep an eye out for these body scans. Uh... Apparently, they can detect skin cancer, like they can verify, like, I don't know, X number of moles, like 100 moles in like just a moment, when normally you'd have to get a biopsy, have it sent away for, to a lab, and then they would come back and let you know if it's uh, malignant or benign. So anyway, keep an eye out. These young, rich people uh, seem to be trying to help out people of the future. And if we can have access to these things for 230 bucks a pop each year, then 100% I'm getting one. So keep an eye out. All right, so what's going on in Palestine? Uh, Biden wants to bring a bunch of Palestinians in. Let's see what it says. The Biden administration is considering bringing in Palestinians from Gaza as refugees into the U.S., but not a single Arab nation is welcoming their own brothers from Gaza. Why is that? Let's find out. Palestinian refugees. The onset of a renewed war between Israel and Hamas has led to fears that millions of Palestinian people living in the Gaza Strip may be forced to become refugees. But despite the fact that Gaza shares a border with Egypt, the Egyptian government almost immediately ruled out any possibility of accepting Palestinian refugees. In fact, Egypt is currently constructing an even larger border wall with Gaza than the one it currently has in place. Now, many outside observers have asked why Egypt, a majority Arab and Islamic nation, would turn away the Palestinian people. And of course, many have pointed out that it may serve the political interests of many Arab nations to refuse to accept Palestinian refugees because it allows them to then blame Israel for any sort of humanitarian crisis that unfolds. But the thing is, historically, many Arab nations have accepted Palestinian refugees. Hmm. And that may be why Egypt doesn't want to now. For example, in 1991, the Kuwaiti government actually expelled nearly 300,000 Palestinians in the aftermath of the first Gulf War. And this represented an astonishing 18% of Kuwait's entire population. So what was the reason? Well, the Palestinian Liberation Organization had actually supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait a year earlier. And this support only grew after Iraq began attacking Israel with rockets throughout the war. After Kuwait's liberation, the government considered much of the Palestinian community to be complicit in the Iraqi occupation of their country. And in response, nearly all Palestinians were deported in just a few months. 
And this wasn't the first time something like this had happened. Decades earlier, the Palestinian groups operating in Jordan had come to openly call for the overthrow of Jordan's monarchy in the aftermath of the Six-Day War. At the time, the PLO maintained its own separate army on Jordanian soil and used that armed force to sow chaos. Armed gangs of PLO militants drove around the capital of Amman, robbing families and businesses in the name of collecting financial assistance for the ongoing war of attrition against Israel. When members of the Jordanian police and army tried to defend their citizens from these attacks, they were attacked and killed. The Palestinian political network operated as a state within a state, with militants repeatedly using Jordan to launch rockets into Israel. The Marxist-Leninist popular front for the liberation of Palestine even went so far as to hijack multiple planes, diverting the flights to a Palestinian-controlled airfield in Jordan where the passengers were held hostage. By September 1970, the Jordanian army had finally had enough. A full-scale war with the PLO broke out, and after 10 months of fighting, the Palestinians were driven out of the country. Yet, as a parting gift, a Palestinian terrorist group known as Black September assassinated the Jordanian prime minister. Sadly, the story doesn't end there, because the PLO then moved into Lebanon, where they allied themselves with Marxist and socialist movements that were seeking to overthrow Lebanon's conservative Maronite Christian government. The presence of thousands of Palestinian militants flooding into the country completely destabilized Lebanon and plunged the entire nation into chaos. Less than four years after the PLO was expelled from Jordan, Lebanon found itself in the middle of one of the most bloody and chaotic civil wars in Middle Eastern history, from which it has never fully recovered. In short, Palestinian organizations have not just attacked Israel. They have sowed unrest in many of the neighboring Arab and Muslim countries as well, and this has led those governments to the conclusion that allowing for mass immigration or even just refugee camp resettlement within their borders would lead to domestic unrest for their own countries. And this, of course, only exacerbates the humanitarian crisis for those Palestinian non-combatants caught in the middle. The problem is, as long as terrorist organizations like Hamas and others are elected to represent the Palestinian people, their plight will most likely continue, as neither Israel nor apparently the surrounding Arab nations want to see their own populations threatened by terrorist groups. Why boom. More like, boom, there it is. Like, right there. This group, historically, whatever country they're in, has a, a terrorist organization rise and that's you know enthusiastically promoted by the people the citizens they vote them in or maybe uh, it's always like it just happens to be a corrupt who's behind it all anyway bottom line is what's going on in all the universities socialist marxism like crazy fights for it well, let's see, let's tune in a little bit later, but maybe this guy's going through some weird things over in, uh, where was this? London, sword attack. All right, deranged individual, let's get a view from the house. So that's the apprehension of the suspect. Uh, as you can see there, it just popped up. Uh, unfortunately, a 14-year-old uh, did lose their life and we pray for their soul. And uh, several others injured. So what's going on over there? Sword attacks. Watch out, people. So what's going on over here in the West? Well, riot police deployed multiple rounds of tear gas and rubber bullets on student protesters at the University of South Florida. Definitely won't be seeing any of this on your local news. Check it out. Not a very authoritative announcement there. Okay, so everyone is obviously being affected by the tear gas there. This is insane. Look at the tear gas. 
It is pretty crazy. But, I mean, that's the classic way of dispersion. You know what I mean? Like, it goes way back to the 60s. You know, that's how they would get rid of it. So, I mean, if you don't listen, if you don't comply, and you're disrupting, the, the goal now is to apparently uh, no comply, then no graduation. So, what else is going on here? NYPD expects to receive a letter from Columbia University requesting them to clear out the protesters from the encampment within the next hour or two. Alerts have also been sent to students instructing them to shelter in place. Look out. All right, what do we have here? Dozens of Columbia students just became felons tonight. They've taken over Hamilton Hall, the library. Let's check out the compilation. This is meant to be your educated youth, okay? The future. Isn't the classic thing, this revolution will not be televised? Is that what it is? Or is it this revolution will be televised? Because this one certainly is. And that's probably why it's not going to go anywhere. Okay, and moving right along, what do we have? Uh, police move in. All right, they're going to go ahead and raid. Let's check this out. All right, let's move on. What do we have here? Protesters announce from the walls to the gate, it is time to escalate. Here are City College of New York as they rush the police line outside CUNY encampment. All right, it seems like it's escalating. Seems like it's calmed down. All right, there you have it. So the police have uh, dispersed the area. So what happens? People who occupied Columbia's Hamilton Hall face burglary charge, NYPD says. So we talked yesterday about them claiming for amnesty. They wanted to make sure that uh, they wouldn't uh, have this trail behind them in the rest of their lives. Well, guess what? You break the law, you become a criminal, you get charged. Because if they don't, then all this Marxist uh, revolution that they're getting on with socialist behavior, 
is going to invite the Palestinians and all of those rogue Muslims over here to usher in this uh, new revolution. And uh, if you don't believe it's coming, then you're sadly mistaken. The authority needs to get this under control immediately and show that uh, when you do commit a crime, you get uh, fined <laughs> and some jail time. Violence erupts at UCLA as rival groups clash hours after NYPD storm Columbia pro-Palestine protest live. There it is. So violent clashes has erupted, have erupted on the University of California's campus in Los Angeles between pro-Palestine protesters and a group of counter-demonstrators hours after police stormed Columbia University and arrested dozens of students. So it's what's being described as horrific violence. Counter-demonstrators shot fireworks into pro-Palestinian encampment at UCLA and wielded poles and sticks as they tore at the protesters' barricade before eventually dis being dispersed by police. So, uh, yeah, some, I wouldn't say it's rival or counter-protesters, I was like people who were fed up with it. Regular humans trying to shut down the radical behavior of uh, the um, protesters. Similar scenes unfold in Arizona and New Orleans as SWAT teams reportedly moved into dispersed pro-Palestinian protesters. They're not pro-Palestinian, they're pro-Hamas. Check out the video at the beginning. It tells you everything you need to know. It's not, if they're fighting for Palestine, then they should be fighting for Israel to destroy Hamas. Like they're, don't you get it? Anyway, it's going on all over. The kids are confused. They're ripe for uh, indoctrinating into social Marxist behavior. And uh, if enough of those rogue Muslims come over with these crazy terroristic extremist ideas of their religion, then uh, they're going to indoctrinate these people and then enslave them. All right. Healthy young Nashville chef, 26, dies while running in marathon as his devastated girlfriend shares her grief. As I can only imagine, we'll pray for his soul and uh, pray for the young girl. Young man working as a chef has died while running a marathon in Nashville. Joe Fetchy, 26, was found unresponsive in the Shelby Park portion of the race, and emergency responders performed CPR according to organizers of the St. Jude Rock and Roll Running Series. Fetchy was then transported to a nearby hospital where he died on Saturday. The man's heartbroken family released a statement to the public calling him a bright light of inspiration. Uh, it is with unbearable grief and immense sorrow that we share our dear, beloved Joey transition to the other side on Saturday, April 27th. Here's an image of the young man. Absolute tragedy. I uh, can't imagine how it's even possible for someone that young and athletic to just go into cardiac arrest. It's absolutely just unheard of uh, in my lifetime. I'm not a young cub, okay? I've been around for many decades, and I've never heard of this, ever. The Rock and Roll Running series also related, released sorry, a statement offering sympathies to the family and friends of Fetchy, pledging to give them support in this very difficult time. Yeah. Another image of the uh, fella cooking up some stuff. But we don't know. The only thing is an autopsy will tell. Perhaps he was really indulgent into lots of fatty foods and he had heart disease. We don't know. But we pray for him. Joey, rest in peace. All right, there you have it. Uh, thank you for joining the Sigma Tiger. We will be coming up with a little thing. As you've seen, I got the uh, full screen on the video there. We might be changing up the format and schedule. So stay tuned. Sigma Tiger, signing out.